The year 2000, our first service in here was January 2000. Half the church had left by then, and we had 300 people left. No matter how creative you are with seats, it looks bad. <laughs> and it was the beginning of ground zero of a new church that we built inside the older church here. These screens are amazing, aren't they? So as you've been coming here for years, like you've come today or more recently, you will come in here and notice these upgrades, these new cutting edge technology screens look fantastic, sexy, exciting. <laughs> Wish you had them in your church. But you're also walking on new carpet that you did not notice. And you're sitting on new chairs that perhaps you didn't notice. And therein lies the problem with the church around the world. We think it's all about this. And these quantum leap, flashy, seen, bolted on to old, really unchanging belief systems that make us kind of look like we're relevant and trendy. But often leadership is more to do with the carpet that you don't see that you came in and walked on because that's not sexy and that's ordinary and normal and who looks down and examines the carpet and I think as I travel around the world, it's kind of the tale of two churches. It's the churches that think it's all about staying relevant, it's all about bolting things on that are noticeable. But when I first got my first iPad years ago and I plugged it into my laptop, it didn't work. So I called my technical support son-in-law, wasn't Steve at that time, probably would be now because he's a technological whiz kid now. But I called Mark, my son-in-law, I said, I don't know what's happening. I've got this new iPad, plugged it into the laptop, nothing's happening. So he came by, and there it is, sat on the table. These two products plugged into each other, nothing happening. So he said to me, how old is your laptop? Which I was offended by because it was a MacBook Air. <laughs> it was thin and posh and stuff. So to ask me how old it is seemed to me like an insulting question because you can see it's modern and new and flashy. And I said, well, it's about four years old. Well, he said, you know, uh, that's probably a bit old. I'm like, dude, it's a MacBook Air. I tell people, I don't use it, but I tell people I have one. <laughs> he said, well, the problem is you've plugged it into this brand new iPad. And he said, let me ask you a question. He said, when you've been using the laptop over the years and it pops up on screen saying, new software update available. And it gives you two options. Download now or not now. What do you do? I said, I always click not now. <laughs> I think I don't need it. It's going to shut down while I'm doing it. So I, I don't need it, so I click not now. So he said, if you've been clicking not now for four years, <laughs> your laptop is so far behind the curve that it doesn't know what just happened to it. And, the, and then I'm, in, I'm into what I call capture then. In seeing something in this picture that became a metaphor for transition and for growth, because these are two Apple products. They're from the same creator. They're joined by a cable from the same creator, but they cannot speak to each other, because one of them has been clicking not now for years. And I want you to know that today is not about quantum leaps, and leadership is not about quantum leaps. It's about the carpet. It's about just keep clicking download now. Something today, just a little thought, a throwaway comment, something you see that you didn't come to see, something you observe, a, a, a line, a thought, a concept, an idea. We're not here to challenge your doctrine or change your theology, though that is desperately needed sometimes for us, but that is not how we grow and change. Growth is thousands of small incremental steps, many of which you would not want to be caught calling growth. Because some of those are backward steps, some of them are failures, some of them are mistakes, and so you don't kind of see them as progressive. But all of these things become progressive, and what makes our leadership progressive is that we don't look for where can we do these things, but we look for where can we click download now on something that is not sexy and not dramatic, but we think if we do that every day on something, that we will stay relevant, because around the world, the progressive churches have leaders that do that every day. And the churches that are lagging behind that once were progressive is because they're led by leaders that have stopped clicking download now and have parked up 
on an old download and have built a belief system around it and built a church around it and it's 20 years out of date. And we can't afford to do that in Europe where 98% of our population are still not in church. We can't afford, those of us that are the church, we can't afford to park up on the good old days and so been in this building that's 17 years old and seeing these upgrades is a metaphor to take away with you today for where you need to just maybe click download now today. Even if it kind of proves to be no good to you. Just download it. And just see if it helps and changes. Don't be defensive and protective. Just, I'll have a look at that. I'll read that book. I'll give some thought to that. <laughs> well, I'm going to read to you from Judges chapter 3, verses 12 to 30, where we I'm going to step into this fascinating to me story. The book of Judges is a fascinating book. Um, if Judges was a movie, it would be a Hollywood blockbuster action high body count movie. Because the book of Judges is just carnage. Uh, I know we kind of disinfect it when we read it and flick the page, but if you just put yourself on pause and try to put yourself in real time on what you just read, it's pretty horrendous. But I find it fascinating who God chose to be judges. And I want you to know today that the reason God calls you is not just to do with getting a job done. The reason God calls you is because God finds something in you that he placed you in you from birth that makes you distinctly useful and uniquely fascinating and interesting to him. And I believe that God appointed these judges not just to right wrongs or to bring the nation of Israel back from its errant ways, but I think he chose these characters, like the one we're going to read about now, because God had placed in them from the beginning this dormant, latent genius that the world never saw as that. Take Samson, for instance. We have been very unkind to Samson. We've been unkind to Thomas. We call him Doubting Thomas. The Bible doesn't call him that. We've called him that. But Jesus deliberately chose a doubter to be in his team, to say to us, I'm not threatened by doubt. It's part of the journey. You shouldn't be either. We've been unkind to Martha, and we've been very kind to Mary, as if she was the sort of sister that didn't get it, because she had the oil, you know, pouring on Jesus' feet and wiping his feet, but she did it in the house of, of Martha, who was using a different oil in the kitchen to cook meals. And churches that are all Mary and no Martha are the ones that forget to pick you up at the airport. Because they're, they're at Jesus' feet. <laughs> and churches that are all Martha and not Mary are too corporate and very organized and there's no heart in it. There's no Jesus in it. So we've got to figure out that all these people bring something to the table. And Samson from birth was commissioned by God to pick a fight with the Philistines. I do a teaching on him called Samson, God's Magnificent Irritation, because that's what he was. And from birth he was chosen to pick a fight with the Philistines because for 40 years they've been under Philistine oppression and nobody's crying out to God for intervention, which suggests they got comfortable. It's called the Stockholm Syndrome. Where the Israelites have got comfortable with being ruled by others and been told what to do and they enjoyed something about that and they didn't cry out to God, so God had to do his own crying out. So he raises up this guy called Samson and when he wants to get a wife from the Philistines and his parents say, you gotta do that, that's not right. He was unreasonable and stubborn. We think that's something that was a weakness in him. It was a strength because the Bible says God was trying to pick a fight through him with the Philistines by him insisting, I want one of those women for my wives, not a Hebrew. And if you've never, if you've never experienced God making you do something, if you've never experienced a destiny on your life that you can't shake off, if you've never experienced something that will not leave you alone, when you want to leave it alone, you'll never understand Samson. So this guy today is fascinating to me, and we're going to read here Judges 3.12. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord because they did this evil. The Lord gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over them. Notice God gave Eglon power over them. And... They took possession of the city of 
palms. The Israelites were subject to Eglon for 18 years. Again, the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and he gave them a deliverer, Ehud, a left-handed man. He is, he is his genius coming up here. A left-handed man, the son of Gerar, the Benjamite. The Israelites sent him with a tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Ehud had made a double-edged sword about a cubit long, maybe a couple of feet long, which he strapped to his right thigh under his clothing. He presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab, who was a very fat man. After Ehud had presented the tribute, he sent on their way those who had carried it. But on reaching the stone images near Gilgal, he himself turned back to Eglon and said, Your Majesty, I have a secret message for you. The king said to his attendants, Leave us, and they all left. Ehud then approached him while he was sitting alone in the upper room of his palace and said, I have a message from God for you. As the king rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand and drew his sword from his right thigh, something nobody ever, ever did, and plunged it into the king's belly. Even the handle sank in after the blade. I told you it was one of those movies. And his bowels discharged. Ehud did not pull the sword out, and the fat closed in over it. Then Ehud went out to the porch. He shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. After he had gone, the servants came and found the doors locked. They said he must be relieving himself. <laughs> he was, but not in the way that they thought. In the inner room, they waited to the point of embarrassment. I don't know what that would be, half an hour, an hour, I don't know. But when he did not open the doors of the room, they took a key and locked it, and they saw their Lord fall into the floor dead. While they had waited, Ehud got away. He passed by the stone images and escaped to Sirah. When he arrived there, he blew a trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went down from the hills with Ehud leading them. Follow me, he ordered, for the Lord has given Moab your enemy into your hands. So they followed him down and took possession of the fords of the Jordan that led to Moab. They allowed no one to cross over. At that time, they struck down about 10,000 Moabites, all vigorous and strong. Not one escaped. That day, Moab was made subject to Israel, and the land had peace for 80 years. By the way, that was the longest season of peace Israel had ever had in this season of their history, 80 years. Now, I want to speak to you about what I'm calling left-handed leadership in a right-handed world. Left-handed leadership in a right-handed world. How many of you are left-handed? Keep your hands up. Well, you're going to be heroes by the time I've done. <laughs> People are going to be wanting your autographs. And that's about proportion, actually, to the ratio in the world. Do you realize, did you know that 90% of the world are right-handed? 90% of the world are right-handed. Primarily, they reckon it's because the brain is cross-wired, as you may or may not know. The brain is cross-wired. And the right side of the body is controlled by the left brain. And the left side of the body is controlled by the right brain. And Right-handers are left brain dominant, and the left brain dominance is to do with communication and language and analysis and logic and reason, things that have been vital, I suppose, to the evolution of our species. Hence, I understand why right-handedness and left brain dominance has been essential to bring us to where we have come as mankind because the skills of the left brain are, of course, vital to the thriving of any civilization. But left-handed people are right brain dominant, and right brain dominance is more to do with creativity and empathy and emotion and spatial ability. That's why a lot of architects are left-handers, by the way. A spatial awareness, a spatial ability Face recognition, the awareness of context and tone and intuition and lateral thought comes from the 
right brain, things that actually are not as vital to the success and the thriving of civilization as what the left brain has to offer. And so today I'm going to touch on a few things, and we won't have time for these all, but it'll whet your appetite if I can't get through them all for you to maybe go beyond today and give some thought to this. I want to first of all use Ehud's left-handedness as a metaphor for a rare kind of leadership that I believe the world, and especially the church perhaps, is crying out for. When I say metaphor, by the way, metaphor is not appreciated by left brain people. <laughs> When you are a sort of logic, analytical, systems, Mr. Spock, left brain kind of person, metaphor is lost on you. I posted something on Instagram a while back and I was trolled, must have been by a left brain, didn't understand metaphor person. And I love and use metaphor a lot. And his life, Ehud's life, and his left handedness, I find fascinating. If I have time, I want to speak to you about how unkind the world has been to left-handers and still is. We 90% right-handers don't know what it's like to be in left-handed in a right-handed world. There's a website called anythingleft-handed.com because tools, sports equipment, golf clubs, Computers, tin openers, pencil sharpeners, blades on knives are all made for right-handed people. And you left his, you left his in here. Can shout him anytime you want because this may help your cause that we get a protest going today. We go and march on Parliament for more, for more rights for left-handed people that have all historically been a persecuted minority. Seriously, children that had a tendency to be left-handed were made to use their right hand by their parents so much so that years gone by and still in societies today the left hand was tied behind the back to force them into right-handedness because it is a right-handed world and you are seen to be disadvantaged let alone odd and weird and peculiar to be left-handed the word in Latin for left is the word sinestra, from which we get the English word sinister. Because the left-hand side of the body has always been regarded as sinister associations in, in medieval plays. The assassin, the criminal, was always left-handed. If you were left-handed, you were considered to be perhaps involved in the dark arts. If you were suspected of witchcraft, and it was discovered that you also were left-handed, this was the final confirming evidence that you must be involved in witchcraft. Seriously. If you were left-handed, you were, you were seen as a person to be suspicious of. You were seen to be dodgy uh, in, in different parts of the world right now. The left hand is used for the bathroom. And the right hand is for social interaction. And so even in many Belief systems around the world still, the left hand is regarded as unclean, even in the Bible. The goats go on the left, and the sheep go on the right. So, so the right-handed dominant world even used the Bible to make the lefties feel somehow there's something wrong with you, and somehow you need fixing. So history is not being kind to left-handed people, but what, but what no one sees coming is that all that persecution and all that unfairness and all that injustice and all that stereotyping that boxes left-handed people in with suspicion and mistrust and negativity produces something in them like it does in any minority. It produces something in left-handed people who, by the way, have had a massive disproportionate effect on history. Did you know that Genghis Khan and Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar and Napoleon were all left-handers? Did you know that the reason in Europe they drive on the right and not the left is because Napoleon made it that way, because he was left-handed? And in the feudal system, when you traveled along the road, in a right-handed world, if you traveled on the left, you traveled on the left because you're 
weapon arm was free to defend yourself against the other passing right-handers. So Napoleon changed it to favor himself. And he changed the travel system to travel on the right so that when you travel on the right, his left hand, his fighting arm was free to defend himself and to fight. So he changed the whole movement of transportation. He made his arm his march on the right and not on the left. So, so impactive, so massive has been the impact and significance lefty south paws have had on history disproportionate to their 10 percent their contribution has been amazing because there's something in them there's something in Ehud there's something that's produced in them it seems this spatial awareness that lefties have is what produces brilliant generals because it was said Napoleon could look at a battlefield could look at a piece of land and in his mind he could instantly see where the troops should be best placed for advantage. It didn't need drawings. They became drawings, but it was, it was mapping what was in his head because he had this right brain dominance of spatial awareness that was attached to his left-handedness that triggered this right brain genius that gave him this massive ability to figure out battlefields. And because right brainness is to do with empathy and connection, his soldiers loved him. Because he was so devoted to them. He wasn't this detached, you know, behind the scenes general. He loved them. This right brain empathy and connection and compassion meant that his armies would do anything for him. So these lefties through history have had these traits none of us knew and have taken time to study. Never mind their impact on art and architecture and culture. The entire 15th century Italian Renaissance was led by Southpaws. Michelangelo was a lefty. Leonardo da Vinci, not DiCaprio, I know you know him, but I mean the other one. Leonardo da Vinci was a left-hander. It was said that when they discovered Leonardo da Vinci's drawings and sketches, what we'd have to call them today were drawings and sketches of helicopters, tanks, aeroplanes, and all kinds of technology that wouldn't come for hundreds of years later. In his mind, he was seeing them and drawing in his own way what he felt the future looked like. And the entire Italian Renaissance was led by these lefties. If you go to the Sistine Chapel at the Vatican and look up, it is Michelangelo's painting of Adam reaching out in his creation to God. And Adam's reaching out with his left hand, which was seen to be so audacious and so ridiculous and so nonconformist and so, so wrong. But it was his way of saying up yours to a right-handed world. <laughs> Google it. It's a fascinating picture. It's Adam reaching to God with his left fingertip and God reaching to him with his right hand. As if he was saying... These left-handers that have been demonized for generations are carrying a certain kind of exclusive rare genius like Ehud did. And to break this 20-year oppression of Israel, God raises up this <laughs> left-hander. I think Ehud and left-handed leadership in a right-handed world to me, represents leadership you don't see coming. It's leadership that is outside the box. It is surprising. It is unpredictable. It is unconventional. It is uncommon. It is unpopular. It is even underdog, which, by the way, all of that we desperately need to reach our country, reach our world. Business as usual, usual churches are... Constantly falling into increasing levels of irrelevance. And so I see something in Ehud's left-handedness that God found extremely useful to break a 20-year oppression because all the right-handed approaches to breaking it, as it were, were not working. So this left-handed leadership steps up and his right-brain creative genius enables him 
to create a bespoke solution because there were no off-the-shelf options available, so he, he forges a bespoke weapon. His right brain genius enables him to think of a way around this that the right-handed leadership, I suppose, more mainstream 90% leadership wouldn't come up with because he's coming from a different part of his creative ability and he creates this bespoke weapon and he hides it under his garments on the right side of his body. So when he approaches King Eglon's secret service, they don't even consider him a threat because he has no weapon on his left side. So to look at him would, to, would be to say he is unarmed, he's not a threat. They probably didn't even pat him down because the other reason they didn't see him coming is because, did you see that? He's a Benjamite. Benjamin means son of my right hand. So he's from a right-handed tribe. He's from a right-handed family, a right-handed belief system. He's from right-handed people. So he's a lefty. In a right-handed tribe, he's the son of the right hand, but he's a left-hander, so they don't see him coming at all. He is a complete shock and awe surprise. <laughs> talk about stealth. Talk about no one seeing him coming. And I, I think he represents what I would call leadership that blends in, for which we have no theology, and we need to find some. Because I've got to tell you, the success of the church in our country is going to be far less about shouting and far more about blending in. We see blending in as a fail because I grew up with, well, we're salt and we're light and we're a city set on a hill and we've, we've majored on that expression. Every single one of those things also has a much more subdued, subtle blending in expression. Salt doesn't have to be so pronounced that it ruins your meal and that's all you taste. And light doesn't need to dazzle. We're Christians, we're Christians. Because we're... light can be subtle. Light can be beautiful. Light can be just there, but not dazzling you. We've dazzled people with our evangelistic presentations for years, and the world are wise to it. And if you know what's happening around the world, you know that leadership that is blending in, movements that blend in, like terrorists, you don't know about the bomber till the bomb's gone off. I hope to God we've got blending in people in North Korea. Hope to God there's people on the ground there that know stuff that we don't know, that are feeding intelligence back to their political leaders because success and progress in all walks of life, it seems to me, owes far more to Blending in than standing out. And this occurred to me recently in Europe when I went to the, have we got the door breakers building here in Holland? Some of you may have been to that building. Look at it. It's, it's B&Q, it's Ikea. When I went to speak there last year, um, and, and the driver took me, and we got there, I said to him, well, where's the church building? I don't know what I was thinking about in my head, but I said, where's the church building? He said, it's there. I said, you're kidding me. It's like a furniture warehouse or some kind of DIY place or, or, or offices or some, it's a corporate looking building, isn't it? And what that word means on the right, the language on the right means it's Middle Holland Conference Center. It's called Middle Holland, Middle Netherlands, Middle Holland Conference Center. There's no church name. There's no church logo. There's nothing about that that says church. This building blends in to the landscape. They built this as a conference center with the church permitted to use it. They built it in conjunction and collaboration with a business guy in the church that put up his millions and they're put in theirs and he has a third of the building and they have two thirds, but it's run as a conference center. It's a money-making machine. And the church have an option to use it every Sunday for what they do and he runs the whole thing all year round and when he wants to use their part, he pays a fee to them. When they want to use his part, they pay a fee to him. It's genius. I built this, we built this as a church. Then when half the church left, and, we, and I realized all the money went out the door, I started some businesses. 
One of which was I turned this into a conference center to rent out to corporates because I realized this is sat empty all week. And so we, we, we started different to these guys. We started building something for church. The moment you put carpet down and ceiling tiles in, it feels like a church. These buildings are rustic and industrial. Some of them are called steampunk. I know. I had to Google that one when I walked around a steampunk design building in South Africa. But they're contemporary and they blend in and nothing shouts church. And I think sometimes we're obsessed with having our name on the building, having our logo on the building. And I came from that background because we're, we're overlooking the city here. So this is a place to emblazon abundant life church. We put center on the building because I didn't want the word church to scare off. Abundant Life Center. Ooh, they probably sell koi carp. <laughs> or people came for life insurance. Abundant Life Center. Or they came to use the gymnasium. Last thing they thought was that it was a church. And I want you to think about what you are doing. And I want you to think about where your leadership is too shouty. Think about where you need to be more aware of subtle and blending in and taking your community and leading your church with some surprises, with some, as it were, left-handed genius. We, we focus, don't we, because we don't know anything else other than to focus on the three years of Jesus' life, but he spent 30 years blending in. You say, we want to be like Jesus, but we don't mean that bit. And even in his three years in public ministry, as you know, he spent a lot of his time trying to avoid people, escape from the crowds, go up to the Feast of Jerusalem on his own schedule. Even his own family said, you know, you want to be a public figure, you should be going to Jerusalem right now. And he said, no, no, any time for you is good. Any time for me is not good. I am on a different schedule to you. And Jesus Spent much of his life trying to blend in. He heals a blind man, then you can't find him. We'd have BBC there. Because he understood the, he understood the beauty. He understood the impact of, of understated, of subtle, of not shouting, of not publicizing everything. You know, Joshua learned from Moses' mistake. Moses sent out the spies high profile. So their return was high profile. Joshua sent out his spies in secret and told no one because if they came out with a negative report, it would only be Joshua that heard it. The nation wouldn't hear it. Then he's managing all of that. And so we learned from the mistakes of Moses, I believe, and the way that he spied out the land when it was his turn to possess it. We notice Moses, don't we, but we forget about his mother that blended in into the Egyptian palace as his mother, and she was paid to be his mom. And she was his mom. We, we look at Moses' leadership, but we forget in the formative years of his life, his mother was right there embedding into him the Hebrew belief system. And when he was old, as we know, he didn't depart from it. He started poorly. Then he had years in that middle, in that twilight zone, but his mother was right there in the beginning. We notice, we notice Elisha and Naaman and the great miracle, but we don't notice this, the slave girl that was human trafficked into Syria and was a servant in Naaman's household. We don't even know her name, but she was the one that set that in motion. She was the one that said to Naaman's wife, there's a guy in Israel that I think could help my master, and he's called Elisha, and she's in the background. She's blending in, as did Esther as did Daniel, infiltrating from the inside out. Nothing like a man, a woman, a person on the inside. And we notice them after they appear as leaders. We notice them once they become prominent and from there we take our leadership lessons and from there we do our teaching and preaching. But I want you to think about looking at their lives before they came, as it were, on the radar because it's easy to spot their leadership then but there is this understated behind the scenes more blended in leadership that I believe we've lost the art of that in all walks of life not just 
often in the church, but in all walks of There is this value and this understanding that we're going to get further. Our cause will get further. We'll have, we'll have re less resistance than we need to have. We, we don't need to pick a fight up front by being too shouty and too up front. Let's just work this thing quietly and carefully and more behind the scenes and below the radar. And this was the problem with our church because we were too shouty. And then in the late 90s, when we reinvented and crossed the church over, I realized that our gift to this city was not to be shouty and to be doing this, but to go and serve them, to go and help them, to go and spend more time in their shoes than ask them to spend time in ours, to go to find them instead of asking them to find us, to, to, not, to not put out a voice that says, you know, you should join us, or we're the good guys, or, or, or God loves you and died on the cross for you when we preach from a distance, and we were in this building distance from them, but our theology made us feel like we we're really helping them. And so in the lyrics of our songs and the, and the, and the, and the words of our prayers, we were, we were loving them and reaching them, but in reality, they weren't here. We had to go and find them, and we didn't go to them with, with preaching or with evangelistic crusades. We just went to help them, to, to, to blend in, to become one of them. To not go and say, we're doing this in Jesus' name, you know, and add on that little bit, take my hand, pray this prayer before I step away. We just, for years, settled down to becoming part of this city, to becoming a help to, to making kindness and love mainstream from our church into our community. And in that way, we did our own version, I think, of blending in, and we still are because we're here generationally. We don't need some big event where all the city turns to Jesus, those, those mentalities are what we should have kept pressing download now and you thinking about years ago. But our local churches are the greatest move of God our cities will ever see because we're the only generational idea God has. And Toronto and Pensacola and all these things will come and go, but we'll still be here when they've come and gone because the church is God's only generational answer to the world. But we have to settle down generationally. And we have to settle down for long term so we don't need surprise. We don't need here we are. We don't need to be shouty all the time. We need to discover the mastery, the genius of this blending in. Huh. To know the value of subtle and understated and this left-handed, right-brain genius to give greater expression to our creativity. The church has not been known, as you know, historically for our creativity. We were the first to demonize TV. We were the first to say this is of the devil, and so the world took it instead, and the church caught up later. But often with, with new things that is happening around the world, we're the first to be threatened by it, as I mentioned earlier, with changes and upgrades, and we therefore cease to continue to be progressive, but this right brain dominance, and by the way, the millennial generation are a right brain dominant We started, didn't we, eons ago with the agricultural age for thousands of years, and then we stepped into the industrial age, and then we stepped into the information age, which is where all this technology and the Bill Gates came from. But that information age that we've been in now for two or three generations is fading. And the, the information age was built on left brain logic. But all those people that staked their lives and their careers and their financial futures on left brain logic pursuits, now all their jobs have gone to Asia. And because they have not developed any right brain skills, they find themselves in midlife without a job because people will do their jobs a fraction of the price in India. These call centers and these different businesses, the financial world, the law world, the technological world, all that stuff's been farmed out to Asia. And so the people that just developed left brain are stranded in midlife because they haven't developed these other empathy and compassion and connection and meaning and significance skills 
that the millennials have. And so we're going to even have to change how we do church to reach a millennial generation. And this is why the church has struggled in our country because the church is being led by left brain dominant people. And if you look at some of the primary leaderships in our church over the years, they have been academically brilliant, academically intelligent, but have had poor people skills, have had poor empathy skills, have not been creative, have not had connection with us as we listen to them. Some of our former archbishops were brilliant in their own left brain logic analysis genius, but lacked connection and empathy, which is what the world are looking for from the church. And so to build lives and churches that are right brain free and dominant, because to break this 20 year status quo, God had to find something, someone, somewhere that represented difference, something new, something no one saw coming. And I believe we still require that in this very changing world, in this world that I mentioned just now has gone through these seasons. And what we call the next one, my name for it is we're in the age of human flourishing. Some call it the conceptual age, but we're in a different ballgame. The information age is not what we're in anymore. It's not that left brain skills don't matter. They do, but they're just not enough anymore. They're just not enough on their own. We have to, we have to get this right brain, left-handed leadership, right brain, as it were, thing working intentionally more than ever and appoint leaders and appoint people and do ministries and do things that are right brain dominant, left brain dominant. Things that are driven by creativity and love and connection and compassion and empathy. And then our churches will flourish because that's what, the world, and especially the millennials, who are our future, are looking for. As I age, as you age, it's not your job to keep coming up with new ideas, though that's not a bad thing. As you age, don't be threatened by the iPad generation, as it were. As you age, your job is to make room for those that are coming up. It's to make room for the air hoods. It's to make room for the unusual and the unquantifiable and the different. Don't be threatened by it. As Steve said earlier about our celebrating difference in the body of Christ, difference in the world. Our job as we age is not to say it's my idea, my way or no way. I've been in those churches around the world and they're dying. But it's not my job to be original. It's your job to be original. You come up with something. My job is to create a culture that your genius thrives, that I'm not threatened by your left-handedness that I didn't see coming. It's different to mine because it's unusual. It's a minority. It's small. It's 10%. But there's something distinctive about it that God chose you for. And it is a huge gift to the, to the team, to the church, to, to our cause. It's to spot these distinctive geniuses and to make room for them. That's my job as I age. Not to insist like Saul that you wear my armor. It's my way or no way. You know, Saul saying, wear my armor, don't you, was not about him helping David at all. It was knowing and hoping he would die, but being seen to have been helping him as he died. And the older generation often do that trick. I hope you fail, but, you know, let, let me be seen to be contributing a bit so I look like I was hoping that you wouldn't. And... That's what Saul was really doing, and I don't want us to have that gap generation around the world, which I see in many churches around the world, where the older generation gets stuck and parked up and are threatened by the emerging generation, because all around the world we have to deal with this, as Steve said, this generational transitional handover, and I don't want to, and you don't want to be present, preventing progress by appearing to be open to it, but really you're not. And you can buy a lot of time by seeming open, but really not being. And delayed change is as bad as no change. Because all change has a sell-by date on it. It has to be done in a certain sphere, a certain window. Come on, let's stand together. Time's gone. Father, we stand here today so grateful, and if we're honest, continually surprised at your inclusion of us. 
that you would even look in our direction, let alone call us and use us, let alone see something genius and brilliant in us. And I pray for every church represented here, every town, every city, every piece of ground in this country, every troubled community, all the complexities that some of you represent in the communities you come from, all the pain, all the suffering, all the three steps forward, two back, all the difficult days, more than you should have had, more than it seems proportionate to others. I pray that in the midst of all this, you will find this spark of genius that God saw in you from the beginning and that you will become intentional about developing it, that you will figure out and find your left-handed genius, that you would become all across this country modern-day versions of Ehud leadership, that the world and the locked up towns and cities never see coming because business as usual is not changing it. And here comes you and here comes your leadership with an out of the box approach to all things with the best spoke ideas and best spoke weaponry that breaks lockups and breaks stalemates and breaks business as usual and challenges the status quo and becomes revolutionary in its nature in our communities. And I pray you discover the absolute genius of blending in in this next 10, 20 years that you will infiltrate politically and corporately and in the social life of the city and in the financial world and in the church world that in all the worlds where you set your foot you will discover the genius of understated and the genius of being less shouty. God help us to give this kind of gift to our country, to our cities. I pray for the emergence of left-handed leadership in a right-handed world. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys. Thank you for listening this morning.